Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Paige Fortna. I'm a professor in the political science department here at Columbia and director of the Salzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. And we are delighted to be hosting this event today. Um, I have a few thank yous, and then I'm going to introduce Dipali Mukhopadhyay, who will then introduce the panelists, and we'll, we'll get into the substance of things. So I wanted to thank um, Columbia Global Centers, which is uh, co-sponsoring our event today. And is Paige Arthur here? Yes, hi, welcome. And thank you for co-sponsoring page to page. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for co-sponsoring this event. And special thanks to Sivgat, who is a member of our Institute now, and who has really done the work to pull this distinguished panel together to talk about this important um, issue today. And of course, thank you to our panelists for coming to enlighten us with your expertise. Um, and special thanks to my dear friend, Japali Mukhopadhyay. Uh, she is an associate professor at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota. She's also a senior expert on Afghanistan at the United States Institute of Peace. She's the author of um, two excellent books, uh, one on Afghanistan, Warlords, Strongman Governors, and State Building in Afghanistan, and then the Hot Off the Presses, <laughs> Good Rebel Governance, Revolutionary Politics, and Western Intervention in Syria. And if you're interested in that topic in particular, we're having Japali come back to give a book talk on her new talk on October 17th, so please keep an eye out for the announcement of that. Um, and of course, a slew of other, both academic and policy, publications on her great areas of expertise. So it's wonderful to have you back to Polly and thank you so much to the panelists and I'll turn it over to you and Polly to introduce everybody else and get us started. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paige. It's such a pleasure to be back at Columbia. It's such a pleasure to be in the company of these three terrific panelists and especially my friend Sebrak who has done the the amazing work of convening this panel, but more generally of bringing his really rich perspective to the Columbia community. And I'm so grateful that he's here. So let me um, begin by introducing our panelists and then um, give you a sense of what we're hoping to do here this afternoon. So first, let me introduce Arif Dostyar, um, who served as the Senior Advisor for the Afghanistan Program for Peace and Development and is currently at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. So welcome, Arif, to New York. Um, let me then introduce Hasna Jalil, who served as the Deputy Minister of Interior for the Government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Welcome, Hasna, to, to New York. And then Sibkatullah Ghaznawi, who is here at the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia as an Associate Research Scholar and served as the Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs um, in the Government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Um, so we're very fortunate to have these three panelists with us. We also have some wonderful longtime friends of Afghanistan in the room, and I'm hoping we're going to have a really interesting and rich conversation. Uh, the topic of, of conversation today is this question of um, engagement and what does that mean? And I just wanted to open the conversation by highlighting this paradox that I think for many of us who have worked in and on Afghanistan, who are from Afghanistan, have been wrestling with since the summer of 2021, which is that most governments, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and firms seem to remain connected, want to remain connected to, and are seeking to remain connected to the people of Afghanistan without engaging, let alone emboldening the new regime in power. And this is a very difficult and sometimes seemingly impossible goal. In different ways, each of you has been attempting to work around or through that paradox. And so I wonder if you can briefly share with us how each of you think about that catch-22. Um, can it be overcome? And if yes, how? So Arif, maybe we start with you. Well, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to SIPA, um, Dr. Dipoli, and also uh, my friend, Dr. Seb Sabrat, uh, for hosting this conversation. I acknowledge that this is a very difficult topic, and um, uh, and maybe uh, we will not have a lot of answers, but I hope that we can raise some questions um, that can 
uh, maybe even reframe our mindsets uh, and, and reframe the question itself. Um, you are right. Uh, to untangle this, I think that uh, we need to probably uh, remind ourselves what engagement is mm -hmm. and what engagement does. Um, from all the conversations that I follow among our international colleagues, it seems to me that engagement is uh, pursued uh, with a goal of influencing uh, policy behaviors, mm -hmm. particularly of the Taliban. If the purpose is influence, um, a change in uh, certain behaviors, then I believe that we need to answer a set of questions um, in order to justify the use of this means. Uh, first question is, what is it that you would like to influence? Um, if it is uh, certain behaviors toward human rights, for example, what does that exactly mean? If it is women's rights, what does that mean? If it is their right to education, to work, uh, to movement, what does that look like? What is it that you are really pursuing and trying to influence? I believe we do not have a lot of clarity on that. The second question is, um, who is then relevant to engage in order to make that change happen, both among the Taliban, but also among the other actors, local leaders, tribal leaders, religious leaders, um, and so forth, women groups themselves. Question number three is, who is best positioned from the international community to carry out such an engagement for this particular topic or purpose that you are pursuing? The last question is, how does engagement work coherently with other tools and means that are available for disposal? such as sanctions, they have to work uh, to complement each other, not work against each other. Do we really have that cost and benefit assessment? Um, I think the worry is not so much about, and this is my take, about the use of um, engagement as a tool, uh, but it's about the how and why of it that we do not have clarity. Just to sum it up, and I, I thought I would just start it really broadly, and as we move on the conversation, we can narrow down. Um, we need to clarify the purpose, uh, one. Two, be transparent about the process. Communicate what it is that, what is it that you're influencing and trying to change, and how Things are moving along the process. Communicate that publicly, but also communicate it to the other side, of course. Um, and then lastly, I would also recommend that we broaden um, our understanding of Afghanistan and that there may not be just one actor group that is um, going to be helpful in the pursuit of that change. I'll stop at that. Thank you. Hassan? Um. I would add two points to what Arif um, has mentioned. And I echo uh, most of the points that Arif mentioned in terms of having a more purposeful um, engagement. But then I also believe that engagement should not mean, I mean, should not dictate the um, um, notion of uh, recognition to the Taliban. Engagement doesn't mean anything. But most of the times when we are talking about engagement, that gives that um, a connotation of, of uh, recognition. Engagement has to be there. Communication has to be there so that we understand at least Taliban's behavior. Um, but at the same time, when we are talking about engagement, it has to be inclusive enough. The engagement should not be only with the Taliban, should be with Afghanistan and the Afghan people. And the main purpose of the engagement is um, to serve the best interest of Afghanistan and the Afghan people. But when I'm talking about inclusivity, it, is in, it means Taliban, it means non-Taliban, it means anti-Taliban. And when I'm talking about non-Taliban, I'm talking about the mass majority of citizens and actors who are not necessarily pro-Taliban, but at the same time, they don't take a stance against the Taliban. 
they can be potential allies to pressurize the Taliban, but um, we need to work with them. They may not necessarily agree with everything that, or all the values that we stand for, but there's one or two values that they may stand for. So the engagement, even if we are engaging with some of these actors, not all of these actors on the ground, we don't highlight them as much as we highlight the Taliban. So whenever we see, or at least when people cares about engagement of um, either Western countries or even Eastern countries, countries in the region, it's only about the Taliban. You can see a picture of these countries sitting with the Taliban. So I do believe that both the engagement should be inclusive and the um, image of that um, uh, engagement that is gonna come out that also should be inclusive so that even the Taliban, but at the same time, the Afghan people would feel like Yes, the Taliban doesn't hear them out, but at least the rest of the world is giving them that platform, even though they don't have the platform inside Afghanistan by the Taliban. So that inclusive uh, inclusivity has to include genders, which includes women as well, which is uh, doing much better than other, fact other actors on the ground. But at the same time, the actors that we are talking about most of the times, either the polit established political movements or the um, um, I would say media platforms, civil society, most of these actors on the ground are very scattered and very small. In Afghanistan, yes, civil society, developing a good civil society has been one of the biggest achievements we have had. But even civil society, it's not just two organizations that we are talking, or organizations that have branches or headquarters in the West. There are very small scattered actors on the ground at the grassroots level who are very effective, but we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that there needs to be a platform for them to, to be engaged, for them to be empowered, and at the same time, um, um, for them to be represented. So I would go with not just having a more purposeful engagement, I would go with having a more inclusive engagement and the representation of an inclusive engagement. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much. This is a very important question. and. Uh, what Arif and uh, uh, Hosna Jalil explained, the purposefulness, inclusivity, all that's very important. Uh, I would like to add to this the practicality of engagement. What are the very pressing issues of today that is affecting larger population in Afghanistan? And what are the challenges that the population in Afghanistan will be facing in five years, 10 years, or 20 years ahead? What are the challenges that international community is facing with that regime being in power? So I would like that we should prioritize our timelines of engagement, considering the inclusivity and purposefulness of it at the same time simultaneously. If we look in the short term, we are seeing that women are not allowed, women and girls are not allowed to have education. And every day passing, for us it is just simply a day, but for women and girls, it is a day of their life lost. So this should be top priority of a short-term engagement, that we should focus all our engagements to changing the behavior of the regime to allow education. Now, how to do it? There is a, a, an extensive work of preparing ground should start. By, prepare, by preparing ground should start, what I mean is, we should understand how do the current government make decision. We must understand it. Where are those venues where they make these political debates on issues like human rights, women's rights, and girls' rights to education and work? So that would be one part of it, to create a clear understanding of how they make those decisions. We can go to details of that, but just I want to point to it. Second thing would be that Currently, actors who are active inside Afghanistan, human rights actors, those uh, girls who come to the street, why is no men seen beside those girls on the street to protest? We should know challenge of those men. Is it arrest? Is it disappearance? If that is the challenge, then what can we do there? I give you practical examples. During the... Uh, previous government, Islamic Republic, uh, Mr. President Karzai and President Ashraf Ghani. Whenever a person was arrested in some rural Afghanistan on the suspicion of being supporter of the insurgents, tons of local activists was, will appear in the provincial capitals and in Kabul, trying to make that person be released by the government. 
Those are civil society activists in my mind. Mm -hmm. They're local villagers and they still exist there. And majority of them are the people who are not pro-Taliban, who are not pro the previous government, but they were pro their communities. So that would be another point of the engagement or this short-term thinking that we must look into customary civil society activists inside Afghanistan who have the capacity to stand on and who have gained and achieved some level of trust in last 20 years with the Taliban. So we we should mobilize them, find them, and then uh, mobilize them for human rights. What would be the other good thing? If we mobilize them, this will provide a feeling of comfort in some room of protection to the activists who come on the street. If they know that somebody from my village or my extended family will come as a group to get me released from the police, the courage will increase. And I expect and I uh, believe this, that men would be ready to come for this cause. So in the short term, we should focus on women's rights, girls' rights to education because it's immediate. Two years have passed. A girl that was 15 years, she is now 17 years, and she is under immense pressure from her, her family to get married. If two years more pass, then her chance to education is gone. Uh, Second part is that from external side, whenever uh, a government official from United States, from United Nations or from European Union go in, they sit with the Taliban. The the, the immediate, the short-term plan should be that human rights issues should be separated from bigger issues like counter-narcotics or anti-terrorism efforts. Because whenever you go with a checklist of four things, if the opposite side has achieved three things, it means they have done 70% of the work. So you should not stress on the 20 or 25% remaining. And that's what happened in the previous meeting between Tom West and the Taliban representatives in Doha. When you read the State Department a statement, the official press release, it says that they have done good in counterterrorism. They have uh, stopped uh, counter narcotics and they are good with tax collection and keeping calm. In women's rights, yes, they are not doing good on it. So that is taking, uh, making a big difference. Women's rights should come to the top of the agenda. Here is another external uh, factors to the women's rights uh, issue that on the outside, we are mobilizing a lot of Muslim scholars uh, from different countries who are going inside Afghanistan. Recently, a group of Muslim scholars from United Kingdom traveled to Kabul. But when they came out, their statement, I will take it completely pro the regime. Their statement was that they have only prevented girls from getting secular education. Now, we should look why this happens. One reason that I'm seeing that whenever these people are interviewed before going to Kabul, they go with complete uh, no preparation. They have no preparation. They come together, they buy their tickets, they go to Kabul, and they believe that if we sit with these turbaned officials, we know everything. I'm coming from UK. I have exposure to these big meetings, and they know nothing. But when they sit in meetings, they get defeated in their arguments based on Sharia. And then when they come out, they have to say something in front of media because they have already lost the argument. And then they say, oh, it is just uh, the uh, secular education. This happened to the previous uh, uh, delegation of Muslims from Indonesia, Pakistan, and India. They went in, they came back, lost with their own uh, argument. So... Another thing that these scholars need to do is, so first thing they should go with extensive preparation in the framework of Sharia logic for support of women and girls' education and work. Second, they should not do it as one-off activity. But yes, UN or European Union told me that go and talk to Taliban, I did it, I did my responsibility. No, your responsibility as a scholar is either to prove to me that Sharia allows girls and women education. And if you believe that, go and prove it in Afghanistan. If you don't believe it, then come and say on media that Sharia doesn't allow it. You should, these ulama should take that risk and we should pressurize them from outside. That's my 
So, Sibdat, I want to push a little on a couple of points that that you've made here. I mean, one of the things I think it's important for us to understand is, as you said, how do governments make decisions, right? This is a fundamental question. And what are the parameters within which this government is making decisions around, for example, girls' education or any number of questions? Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which you think the Taliban has managed to consolidate rule in the face of global isolation, how it and how it conceives of its governing project. Like what are the parameters within which engagement on questions like this can happen from the perspective of the regime? Can you talk a little bit about that? And can you also say a little bit more, you've referenced various civilian actors, various international actors. What kinds of of mobilization or interaction have you seen that are working or that are moving the needle in a certain way, or have you not seen that yet? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, question is quite complex and uh, as uh, many friends here uh, would not know, after the fall of the uh, elected government in August 2021, I didn't get an opportunity to leave Afghanistan right away. I was stuck there in Afghanistan for a while and was moving around the country for personal safety. Uh, but at the same time, I was observing how is this government evolving? And that continued for one and a half year. So I observed a few things. Uh, and the, the current government is still in the process of evolution and adopting itself. Uh, a few important things that were uh, one was they, they have diversified their way of communication and outreach to the communities. One venue already they had as the representatives of religious clergy was the mosque, but they added to it the system of, uh, large system network of establishing new madrasas, all the way from primary level to the central Darlulum or, uh, 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 which it could be equivalent to a college. Uh, as of today, they have established 15,000 uh, madrasas, uh, 27 of which are uh, of the level of college. Uh, and what is this doing? This is providing a good system of putting the, the existing authorities in diverse linkage to the community and also portray a picture that they are doing something for the community education and all that. Uh, Second thing that is done, uh, taking advantage of the uh, resources that exist in Afghanistan uh, for financial purposes, uh, mining. Coal mining is uh, very big. Uh, recently, other categories are added to it. Uh, when you follow the news uh, in last few months, uh, contracts that were signed with different companies I think uh, its value over the next five years is $6 billion uh, different. And many of these companies have partners and shareholders from China. So that's, we may not see it upfront on the news, but when you call people whose companies this and who is, who are the technical people in this company, you find that there is a Chinese engineer already there. So that is the financial resources. Uh, third thing, they're using local councils, but under a different name. Uh, in uh, most of the provinces, Afghanistan has 34 provinces. In more than 20 provinces, ulama councils are established, ulama religious scholar councils. And these are not ulama who are members of the movement of Taliban. These are ulama or religious scholars from the general community. They are selected into these councils. And they are providing a bridge between community and uh, the government. Uh, another dimension of it is that the uh, the formal relationships that neighboring countries have established with the government, uh, despite saying internationally that they have not recognized the government, but officially every negotiation and communication goes on very official level. A week ago, you might have seen in the media that China's ambassador officially went and met the acting prime minister or chief of the cabinet. 
So that type of relation diplomatically exists uh, and it is there. Uh, another thing they have added to this whole uh, system is that uh, they have established Darul Ifta or House of Decrees. This is a place where you bring together scholars and whenever uh, an issue of national issue, a national importance uh, issue comes up, they refer it to this uh, office. And that office comes up with all the rationale of their decision and they finally give a decision. And uh, most of scholars, now they have a Darlifta in Kandahar, they have one in Kabul, they have one in Herat. Uh, you don't see those names normally on the media, but when you look to their backgrounds, most of them are aged scholars of the movement who were not on the military side, they were mostly on the education side, and they're sitting in those circles and providing advice to the government. So I think these are the mechanisms that have helped the regime to consolidate. Then uh, selective allowance to the media. Uh, for example, there are hundreds of YouTubers who put videos on YouTube, but every second video tube, uh, this uh, YouTube video is about a project of the Kabul municipality, a project of the Kostepa Canal or something other. Uh, and it is indirectly a big uh, propaganda for the government. So when you ask that media is not allowed, they will tell you that there are 100 videos posted today, but none against the regime. So given that the second piece of my question then comes, which is, is there, have you seen examples or room for influence or shifting in decision making as a function of actors outside the regime, advocating, pushing, threatening, anything that suggest substantive movement on policy for the government? I believe that moving through the framework that they have established for their decision, whenever they make a decision, they will say, according to Sharia, mm -hmm. if Muslim scholars come together and work extensively on that, it is possible. Yes, we can uh, make argument there. Uh, second thing is they have made promises. For example, on allowing girls' education, promises are made every few months by the official spokesperson. But nobody has gone back to call from outside. This would be more uh, a suggestion for people from outside to go back and hold them accountable on what they promised. For example, in 2021, October 2021, spokesperson of the government said, we will restart schools for girls according to Sharia. So the question should be, how is education according to Sharia? Please give me that. Let me read it. And when are you going to start it? Where is your plan? Step one. I believe it's possible, yes. Okay. Arif, I want to um, ask you to explain a little bit to our audience the effort you have undertaken at mapping the various stakeholders um, on the in the landscape. One of the things you said in your opening comments is, Always one thinks of the Taliban as the object of engagement, but in fact, there are a number of other actors. Can you share with us um, the degree to which you think our analysis is, is overly focused on the regime versus other actors and give us that picture? Who are these actors and institutions? And also, can you reflect a bit on what possibilities exist if international engagement happens with these non-regime actors, but also what are the risks in a, in a lot of contexts, including Afghanistan over the last 20 years, we see that outside engagement is often depoliticizing. It's um, It makes the focus on donor interests. It makes the focus on external concerns. It can be very undermining of indigenous political projects. Is there a convening role or a supporting role for foreign actors? Or do you think at this point we should let those inside the country engage on their own terms with one another? That's such an embedded, loaded, uh, uh, multiple questions, actually. But um, let me just quickly ask another question to what Dr. Sabat said and then, um, and then come to your question. Is on the question of uh, decision making, uh, I think it would be interesting to find out if there is a really process mm -hmm. of decision-making uh, in the Taliban regime, 
or are those institutions, including the ulama councils that are being established and so forth, and even madrasas, are spaces where you legitimize the decisions that you have already made. Um, I think that that needs to be studied and maybe um, clarified on just a side note. On the stakeholders, yes, I'm part of an ongoing um, stakeholders mapping study. And recently we talked um, with a number of people, um, both inside Afghanistan and outside of Afghanistan, diverse group of people. And we asked them from your vantage point, who do you see as relevant actors? And um, it was really interesting. There was a big number of uh, actors that uh, were collected uh, that unlike the common uh, perhaps belief outside uh, are actually active, uh, both inside of the country and outside. About half of these groups that were told to us are currently functional inside the country. And about half of them are outside. Um, and even those who are inside have access points um, abroad. Um, and um, some of these groups are more well-established uh, with bases, and base meaning that they have a constituency in a certain uh, more specific geography uh, within the country. Now, those bases may not be activated right now toward any political goal, but that those bases do have the potential uh, to be activated uh, to pursue certain political objectives um, in the future. Um, it was also interesting that there are a great number of emerging actors. Mm -hmm. um, and these are those groups that um, particularly either formed or significantly reformed after uh, 2021. And again, I would like to emphasize that many of these groups are actually inside the country. Uh, and then a third category of groups are still forming, um, such as victim, victims groups that are very important to engage and, and include their voices in any uh, type of conversation about Afghanistan. They may not be as organized as the first two categories of actors, uh, but they are forming. Um, and so we will we will follow that and, and track. And um, all of these groups, um, they um, uh, come from a variety of backgrounds. So if you look at, for example, ethnic diversity, there is gender diversity that exists, geographic diversity exists. And like I said, both inside and outside of the country. It was also interesting to find out that many of these groups are actually interacting with the Taliban, mm -hmm. um, regardless of uh, their current location, uh, whether it's inside or outside. Um, the, the nature of that interaction, depending on which movement and group you talk to, is different. Some of those interactions are incidental. Uh, for example, certain civil groups that might uh, permission to um, carry out a certain type of activity would have to go and get a license and, and a letter, that type of interaction, to maybe releasing prisoners, to preventing detention, uh, to uh, protecting uh, uh, properties and assets and even uh, populations. Uh, Substantive interaction does not exist uh, on major issues such as governance and uh, uh, so forth. It, it exists, but it's it's very minimal, and um, uh, uh, most of the people believe, most of these actors believe that that's, that space for more robust uh, interaction um, does not exist, or that the regime is not really willing to enter into more substantive and robust uh, discussion about these uh, important uh, topics. These people have also, um, these groups have noted that space is of course very limited inside the country, but interestingly that space is also limited outside of the country, mm -hmm. that they cannot even convene if they want to have some kind of political activity. They, that space does not exist for them abroad 
um, as well. That limits. And so uh, that uh, we sometimes expect, why are they not mm. protesting? Why are they not showing activity? Space is really shrinking. Um, and, and, and we can talk about that. There's a number of um, reasons. They have also had a number, of, a, a couple of asks. And because um, part of the study, I interact with a lot of them. Their number one ask is that their existence be acknowledged, that Afghanistan does not belong to one group, that it belongs to everybody, that these groups are there. They may not have the type of organizations that we think they should have. And I have a director, a deputy director, and this process of you is how you make decisions and so forth, but that they exist in our own way, in a very local, traditional way, uh, those movements uh, exist. And that they also want to be uh, engaged. The last point I would like to make about these movements is that they do realize the need for unity and, uh, and they have shared it. But they also kind of push back a little bit on this narrative. And they say, we're not picking up arms against each other. Why are you so coming after us and asking us to be united? We are united on big issues. So they, they do realize the need for coherence and uh, cooperation. Uh, but they also push back a little bit uh, on that. Um, in terms of, um, again, like I mentioned, in terms of the role of the international community and the risks um, involved with it, um, I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of interaction is actually already happening. Mm -hmm. One thing that was very interesting, because I wanted to learn the interconnectedness between all of these groups. Everyone is talking to everyone, either directly or indirectly. So discussion, debate, or even you can call it dialogue. That happens. That exists. Again, it, 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 it is different when you talk about what topic for uh, toward what purpose. Um, but that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the interaction uh, definitely exists. I think the risks, maybe our international colleagues here could also talk about that. Um, uh, I've heard maybe a couple of uh, challenges uh, uh, attached to engaging uh, these other groups. One is that if the international community engages uh, non-Taliban groups, then the Taliban will be upset. Um, but of course, these movements, if you talk to them, they say you shouldn't let the Taliban dictate the terms. Um, but maybe, maybe there is some kind of a, a, a middle ground. And one thing is if international community, which is a very broad term, so let's say country X. Uh, for example, the United States has three envoys for Afghanistan. One suggestion is that they may divide the role and maybe each envoy take one segment of the society um, and engage. And that way they will be able to engage uh, many people. Anyhow, that, that, that is up to our international colleagues. The second challenge and risk um, that I've heard from our international colleagues, again, is that um, is also some of our Afghan uh, uh, people uh, say is that many is many of these actors also carry certain type of baggage mm -hmm. or labels with them, and so in this context, it's very very easy to exclude uh, uh, people from uh, being engaged. Someone is labeled with the T uh, word. Someone is. Uh, a warlord, someone is corrupt, someone worked with the former government, someone is old, someone is too young. And so you have lots of people with bad history. You have a lot of people with no history. Mm -hmm. And so you end up not engaging anybody. And uh, and so uh, we, of course, understand the challenges and, and yes, those risks are there, but this is the country you are dealing these are the challenges that you have. We have to engage and discuss uh, with uh, uh, all of these people. There are multiple realities, not just one reality. Thank you, Ara. 
Finally, Hosna, I'm, I would, before I open up the conversation, I would ask you to share with us your understanding through the work you've been doing of the various kinds of organizing and communal support that women's groups, but also ordinary Afghan women have been engaged in since 2021. Of course, quote unquote, Afghan women are not a monolith. And so it would be helpful also for you to talk to us about the complexity of perspectives and experiences and understandings and politics of, of the women with whom you engage. And a similar question, I guess, to the one I asked Arif about international engagement. We know how often, um, especially in Afghanistan, women's rights have been instrumentalized by outsiders to their own ends. Colombia's own uh, Laila Abu Lugod famously described this notion as, as Muslim women who need saving as a motivation for the beginning of the war 20 years ago, the, or the latest chapter of the war in 2001. Of course, that mission was dropped in 2021 when the withdrawal happened. So given how poorly the last 20 years of intervention went, can you... Talk to us about what you think a constructive role for outside engagement looks like, if any, at this time, when it comes to your the women who are your interlocutors. Um, I think each country's, or at least each Muslim country's experience of instrumentalization of women's rights by democratic states or Western countries is very different. Afghanistan's case might be, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic about Afghanistan's case compared to how women in some of the Middle Eastern countries think. Um, yes, there has been wasted waste of resources when it comes to the women's project programs or um, um, I would say improving women's situation or status in Afghanistan. But let's accept that Afghanistan of 2020, 2001 compared to Afghanistan of 2021 in terms of Women's progress was very, very, and I would, as I mean, I would, um, I do believe, I, I strongly believe that it was a very, very fast-paced progress. Um, in twenty years, and I would give the credit to first the women who really, really struggled, who had to fight at so many different fronts to get to where they have been. And I've worked with most of these women, I've lived with most of these women, and I have visited most of these women all across 34 provinces in Afghanistan. And I was privileged enough through my work to be able to visit different corners of Afghanistan. Um, yes, it was a fast-paced progress. The credit goes to women in Afghanistan, to their supportive family members, and to the international community who facilitated through resources, through technical supports, and giving them the platform, designing programs for them. Yes, I mean, nothing was ideal. There has been a lot of grievances against, I mean, around the um, some of the programs, some of the resources that were wasted, but I don't consider that as, um, uh, I would say, I, I don't have the same story of some of the other countries in Afghanistan. I mean, that's my personal perspective, maybe. Um, but then at the same time, in Afghanistan, me as a little girl living in a village in Afghanistan, which was somehow one of the strongholds of the Taliban during the previous Taliban regime, we did not perceive the invasion of 2001 as a saving mission of Afghan women. We were very clear that the U.S. invaded Afghanistan because we had a regime led by the Taliban, and Taliban was associated to al-Qaeda, and that was directly associated to 9-11. Uh, but then this women's right was in a very tiny corner of that bucket. And we tried to um, use that opportunity as much as we could. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, women's right. Yes, it was one of the narratives in 2001 when I'm looking at the archives of most of the U.S. government. Yes, that was one of the narratives that was used to convince the Americans, maybe, like, OK, when, when we are going there, it's just, just not just the counterterrorism. There are so many good stuff out there that we are also going to do or engage in that. But from an Afghan's perspective, I don't think any Afghan woman believe that the Americans are here for us. Um, so that is one thing that I do believe Afghanistan's experience or Afghan women's experience has been very different. Um, even in, in the rural areas, I, I come from rural areas to the urban areas. So 
that was our belief. The second thing is um, when it comes to how the international community can, can help Afghan women. Um, now, every country can play a different role. We cannot expect all the countries to, to play the same role in Afghanistan. Each country have different sets of values. Each country have different sets of interests. Um, so there are Islamic countries who can have the debate of the Sharia um, or women's right within Sharia framework with the Taliban. That has not helped anything so far, but that has challenged the Taliban terribly, I can say. And that has created that tension between the Taliban and between the Taliban and the public. Like, okay, look at the other Islamic mm -hmm. countries. They're also um, hitting the core of the Taliban in a sense like, okay, you came here to establish an Islamic rule and you keep failing that because none of the Islamic countries agree with you. So yes, the Islamic countries, because most of them, unfortunately, are authoritarian regime, we cannot expect them to stand for Afghan women the same way the democratic regimes in the West are standing. We cannot expect China to stand for Afghan women. China has different interests. China has different sets of value. We cannot expect Iran to do the same. Iran is way worse than the Taliban for their own women. So, But they can play a role in Afghanistan when it comes to both um, women's right, human right, they can have a seat around the table to talk about Afghanistan. Um, and that table offers something to, to each of them. So one, we need to have our very realistic expectation from every country. And that is where we can have them like, okay, this is your space to talk. For me, Islamic countries can play a major role in terms of challenging the Taliban. Democratic countries can play a very uh, critical role in, at the UN or at any other multilateral organiz uh, organization where they can push for women right as one of the top priorities. Like, okay, we are not going to recognize you unless your women are having equal rights like, like your men or they're equal citizens like your women because that is also our core value. And that's where we stand for. That's why the world is looking up, up at us, at least the citizens, even if not regimes. So each country, the expectation should be very different. And then the third thing is uh, we should not allow ourselves sitting in the West, me as an Afghan who's raised, who's grown up there and who has lived until 2021 in Afghanistan and have lived so many different lifestyles in Afghanistan, all the way from a very religious conservative background to considering myself an urban modern woman, an independent one. Um, I don't take the right here to make a decision on behalf of my sister, what is her, her priority under the Taliban's regime. I, would, I do believe that we need to give them the space and they are trying to find their ways to express themselves, either through social media, through anything that the Taliban cannot control it as much as they control the mass media. They're trying to express themselves and their priorities are very realistic, very practical. They know what their priorities are. They know what their priorities of today is and they know what their priorities of 10 years later might be. So they are focusing on the core and we are fo focusing on the edges here sitting in the West. They want education. They don't care about the dress code. They don't, don't care about the um, co-education. They care about the going back to the workplace because a major number of working women in Afghanistan are single moms because they want to feed their kids. So for them, if they want to, to present themselves to be back in the workplace, they don't care if they're working with men or they're not working with men. But we are here in the West or even their access to justice. They don't want the very like modern way of seeking justice. They, they, they're okay to go with the traditional means, but they, don't, they do want justice at the end of the day. And the same goes with food security, the same goes with shelter. Because they are there in the middle of trouble and they want to survive. That's why they're coming with very practical, feasible priorities. And then here we in the West, we are stuck with Burqa. I mean, I'm talking to my cousins in a province in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm talking to my aunts in, Afro, in, in different provinces in Afghanistan. When I'm talking to them, like, okay, what is your priority? Or I'm talking to my colleagues who have worked together with me. They have been across different provinces. They have been in the headquarter in Kabul. And now for safety, they are, they are back to their communities. When I'm talking to them, they're giving me a different sets of priorities than what we are discussing here. 
So for me, I think the situation right now is not ideal. Even back then, I mean, during the last 20 years, I don't think that women had achieved their full potential, no. But we did have a foundation, the legal framework that they could grow, they could demand. We did not have all the resources to meet all these expectations, all these demands. But they did believe like, okay, we can achieve it if we, if we keep pushing the government, the civil society or different actors on the ground. But now the situation is different. And from my perspective, the most practical way even to engage and talk with the Taliban about it is to keep a categories of priorities. Like what is my first priority? What is my second? What is my third? And to me, what the woman in Afghanistan is saying, that should be the forefront of everything. If the Taliban is negotiating on like, okay, the woman has to, uh, should not engage with or, or, or interact with their male colleagues or with their uh, male classmates or whoever. We don't have to acknowledge like, no, we agree with you. We don't have to do that. We will let that to, to happen by women, by men in Afghanistan, maybe in the next five years or 10 years. But we also don't have to negotiate on that. We don't have to press on that. For us, there are like six or seven main priorities for the women in Afghanistan that we need to prioritize. And I do believe that part of the engagement, the negotiation, not the negotiation, but the engagement, the talks that UNAMA is doing, the Western countries are doing, the Afghan diaspora is advocating for. It has to be based on those priorities that the Afghan woman from inside Afghanistan is telling us like, okay, this is what I want. At the end of the day, all those priorities are getting back to one point where they want to get out of homes, their homes. They want to be out there in the society, in the communities, to school, to workplace, and they don't care about how that happens. If, if there would be limitations in terms of dress code or women, men's interaction or like, um, like having different buildings, even like we do have for medical doctors. Um, but at the end of the day, they do believe, and that's what we believed in the last 20 years, they do believe once they are present there, they do have the potential or the opportunity to change all these edges around it. So from my perspective, I do believe that we need to, it's time for, for us to need to, uh, to, to listen to uh, women inside Afghanistan. And that, I mean, there are so many different platforms that women um, individually can express themselves at the Global Friends of Afghanistan, where Annie is um, one of the founding members, and Annie has been a great um, uh, mind behind one of the initiatives where it's called Idea Shora. We've been able, it's it's launched just, just a few months ago, I think, Annie. Um, we've received essays from all Afghan, young Afghan, men and women, and we have had the privilege to go through their ideas. There are some really crazy ideas. <laughs> there are some really constructive ideas. Some are very pessimist. Some are, are very optimism, uh, optimist. But at the end of the day, when you look at how passionately people are writing mm. in a very tight deadline, it just means they need a platform to express themselves. And when it comes to women... Yes, there are platforms that women dist does not trust them anymore. They do believe that they're project based, they're donor money based, or um, they're collecting our ideas to create a new project. Um, but at the end of the day, if they would be, I mean, uh, the women would be given the platform, they are very much mentally ready and thoughtful enough to tell you, like, what is my priority? Mm -hmm. So, yes, when it comes to um, Afghanistan's case, I am still grateful of the international community's engagement, resources, dedication for us being where we are now. Today, pushing back the Taliban, and this was not an experience we had in the 1990s. Mm. Afghan women were very silent. And today, women in Afghanistan, I'm not saying this because I'm a woman, but women in Afghanistan are at the forefront of civic movement. They're very much more organized than any other civic movement. They're very united in, yes, there are diverse voices, but very united in the core of what they want. When it comes to Afghan women, not this is the um, one of the points you mentioned, and this is my last point. When it comes to Afghan women not being united in terms of their thoughts or demands, yes, the gener different generations plays a role in that, like the generational difference. Grandmoms think differently. They're more conservative. Our moms are thinking differently. We have had more exposure. We may think differently. But at the end of the day, none of these generations are challenging each other in terms of uh, dismissing each other's thoughts. So my grandmom may, be, may not be against education, but might be against co-education. Mm -hmm. 
but then that's what I want. Mm. Um, that's why I do believe that, yes, there are different, um, um, I would say, ways of thinking. But at the end of the day, again, when it comes to those core priorities, that is something that is shared between different generations and across different geographies in Afghanistan. And there's one more thing that most of the times Afghan women are given as an example of a woman in the very rural area who doesn't even know what how education would improve their lives. They have no idea. They have never lived a better life. Uh, how can we expect them to stand for a better life if they haven't had that experience? So that is our job to provide them that platform to give them examples of how education improves their lives or how them being financially independent improves their lives. So that is not a valid example for me if somebody would give me that example. But they also do not oppose education. They do not, do not oppose employment. So Yes, we need to let them um, prioritize for themselves those who are in Afghanistan and the international community together with the Afghan diaspora that I'm unfortunately now part of. Um, we need to facilitate or provide resources, means, technical support based on what they want. Thank you, Hosna. What an incredibly rich set of comments and reflections. I want to now, we have a lot of people in the room with a lot of experience and interest, and we have almost an hour to open up the conversation. So um, we have a microphone in the middle of the aisle. I would just ask you to please come to the microphone um, if you have a question you would like to make, and please make sure to introduce uh, yourself to us. And maybe depending on how, how many folks want to ask questions, we may end up collecting a few, but Ali, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, important talk. And uh, I have a few points. One is uh, the engagement. Uh, Arif said that the purpose should be to influence uh, policy uh, behavior. But uh, and the focus was mainly on women's rights. If you look back at the history of the Taliban's behavior towards women's rights, we, uh, I'm not sure if you can find any indicator that could help us uh, ping hope on engagement. For example, during their, uh, their first uh, Emirate in 1990s, they banned uh, women education, and then just during their insurgency, they banned uh, women's education in contested areas and districts. I was working with uh, Afghanistan Analyst Network, and of course we had a research project looking at uh, districts that were controlled or contested by the Taliban, and that research project was funded by USAID. And we looked at that wherever they had control, of course, they did not allow girls to go to school. And so these are like the two historical uh, things that show that the Taliban will never uh, allow women's uh, education. And the third thing is that even on women's, of course, we are talking about engagement. Engagement is already happening. It has been happening since uh, Ambassador Khalilzad met them in Doha. And of course, they on day off, this engagement looks like patronizing the Taliban. And now we are still talking about engagement. And that is, I think, might, might be frustrating for most of us. Unamo is there. And I am glad that our good friend Scott is here. And uh, they were supposed to do, for example, uh, facilitate the humanitarian uh, aid uh, delivery to the people, one thing, and the second to document the things, and I'm glad they are doing very well on that, the uh, human rights abuses. And the third, to influence, but they are now backing down themselves, and women are not allowed to to work with the uh, UN organizations. And instead of influencing other uh, uh, Taliban behaviors in other areas, even the UN is backing down 
in its own house, in, in its own arena. So how can we, my question would be, how can we, uh, for example, hope that the engagement that has been happening uh, would work? And the second point is, we are, we are having a very reductionist approach towards the situation in Afghanistan. We just focus on women's rights. Of course, my heart breaks every day when I see, for example, my uh, relatives, girls, uh, they cannot go to school. And uh, but uh, that is a very reductionist approach. And uh, or if uh, somehow mapped the stakeholders, I think we have women as the first and primary stakeholder. Then we have ethnic groups, and then we have the new generations, and then we have the fourth and victims and networks. We are only focusing on one stakeholder, so it is women. And of course, if the new generation, they have not abandoned their uh, dreams of a pluralistic Afghanistan, regardless of their ethnic background. Even I think there could be many new generations within the Pashtun community. And of course, the Taliban are somehow representing the same community. It might be a, a sort of provocative comment, but they are, for example, uh, representing but we are ignoring ethnic groups and new generations and uh, victims' rights. So without a pluralistic approach, I think this reductionist approach will just prolong the suffering of the people. That is, and my last point, sorry, I, uh, I <laughs> oh, yeah. have to go to Instead of, I think instead of engagement, we should really talk about international public diplomacy that should go along with the sanctions against the regime and its members who are uh, imposing sort of gender apartheid against women. And that international public diplomacy means to, uh, to send the messaging to the people of Afghanistan, what these sanctions mean, why they are there. And uh, when we are engaging, what what we do for for the people of Afghanistan. Otherwise, okay. it is just talking that we are we want to. Uh, this is like deceiving the people of Afghanistan. They say that we want to uh, uh, not abandon the people of Afghanistan. When they meet, they say that we focus on counterterrorism. Yeah. This is, of course, the Taliban because of their brutal way of ruling, they might be good at uh, uh, suppressing terrorism, but that is when you uh, just talk on that uh, talking point, it means you are patronizing them uh, uh, so that they can be even more brutal towards the people of Afghanistan. So I think the way we approach is, is not working and it is really prolonging uh, the suffering of the people. Thank you very much. Sorry that. I Thank you, Abby. Thank you. I'm going to collect a bunch of comments and then we'll we'll do a round of reflections back. Barney, please and please introduce yourself. That was Ali Adili, now a student at Columbia. Hi, <clears throat> Barney Rubin, retired professor. Um, first, I want to say, of course, as you may imagine, I am exposed to a lot of discussions with this question. This was the best one I've heard. And I think that it illustrates some points. I'll draw that out when I uh, make my comments. My first point is that engagement is not the same as political negotiation. Political negotiation is one small component of engagement. Um, but if you say, if your question is, how can you negotiate with the Taliban in such a way that they change their policy? My answer is you cannot. There's, there's no combination of threats and incentives that will make the Taliban change their policy. It won't, that won't happen. However, one thing to bear in mind is how much we don't know. How much we don't know about the Taliban, about Afghanistan, and about the neighbors of Afghanistan. And I've always found that the people who are most certain about all those things are the people who have had the least actual contact. Uh, because <laughs> when you have contact, you see that there are possibilities you never imagined. Not always good ones, by the way. 
Um, now, but in, but in this type of engagement, you know, not only with the Taliban, with other Afghans, and I'll, I'll come to some other points, it's not possible if you do not go to Afghanistan. Now, right now, there is a huge inhibition about going to Afghanistan, because if you go to Afghanistan, a whole lot of people will say you're supporting the Taliban. But by recognizing that they exist and they are in power. So that is a problem. We have to think of how to deal with it. You know, I say, you know, you know, there are 40 million people in Afghanistan who are not Taliban. So how do we uh, talk about that? Um, so that's, that is a big obstacle. Second, we've talked a lot about we. We should do this. We should. Who's we? Who's we? Uh, uh, stop doing that. You know, it, it, usually it means you, you want the U.S. government to do what you want. But I have, I, I'll, I'll just say something you all know, but maybe you don't put it in practice. The United States government does not represent Afghan. The United States government does not represent the interests of Afghanistan. It is pointless to try to convince the United States government to represent the interests of Afghans. That's not what it is. That's not what it does. Uh, it's almost ex exactly true for the United Nations as well. So we have to figure out in this political situation how to advance the interests of Afghan, national interest and their social interest. Second, a lot of this discussion about engagement takes place in some kind of a bilateral framework. Engagement between the United States and this non-existent entity called the West and the Taliban or Afghans. But that's not the political environment we're in right now. Afghanistan is a landlocked country. The United States has disengaged. Europe is far away. Afghanistan's neighbors are China, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Pakistan, and close close neighbors. I may have missed someone. I don't know. Uh, close neighbors include India and Russia. That's who. And the Taliban are talking to all of them. So when the person that you are engaging with, and, and not only the Taliban, other Afghans too. So when you are engaging with someone and you don't take into account who else they're engaging with, you will, uh, you will uh, have the wool pulled over your eyes. Um, for instance, for a long time, the United States conceded a monopoly on talking to the Taliban to Pakistan. And uh, that did not have a good result. Um, now, that means that we also need, we need to, we, whoever I'm doing now, you know, <laughs> in terms of official, even official diplomacy needs to engage with the neighbors of Afghanistan as well. And don't assume, just like we shouldn't assume that stereotypes determine the behavior of Afghans, we shouldn't assume the stereotypes behave, they're in the behavior of uh, the neighbors either. For instance, China and Iran, I have engaged with both. Uh, have vastly different points of view, and it's a vastly different uh, experience engaging with them. In fact, it's a vastly different experience engaging with the current Iranian government than it was with the previous Iranian government. Um, if we, if the United States can't deal with Russia and Iran right now, we have to think of who can. And one purpose of engagement that you demonstrated but did not state is Engagement is a way of learning things. Um, we, in the government, people, when I was in the government, people would say that engagement is a form of intelligence collection. But um, it's an environment where we have so little information. Um, now, I, I could go on, but I, I'll try not to. But I'll just mention one thing okay, about <laughs> my, my little experience with engaging with the Taliban system. I went to Doha to see someone in the Taliban whom I knew. Uh, and this was right after the first decision about girls' education. And so he told me the minister that the minister of education had presented a plan for education in the cabinet, which included girls being educated. And Mullah Hassan, the chairman of the Council of Ministers, said, This is how, what he quoted, and I cannot verify this. We did not fight jihad for 25 years or however long, in order to adopt Western customs. He did not say in order to abandon Sharia. 
He said, in order to adopt Western customs, because no one has ever said that educating girls is against Sharia. You cannot say that. It makes, it, it's obviously untrue. So the Taliban have a different motive. And I think there's, you see, they're not, they're not Sharia driven automatons. They are political actors. And right now, what is the most important thing Hibatullah is doing as far as he's concerned? He is building up an independent military force that answers to him alone, that is report, recruited from rural southern Afghanistan, which is independent of the, of the interior ministry and the defense ministry, both of which are headed by people who oppose him. Um, uh, and one of the conditions for his getting those people to be personally loyal to him is that he do things like this, not because it's Sharia compliant, but because it's consistent with the traditions of certain parts of rural Afghanistan that he, that he, could, that he convinces them. And if he doesn't do that, he won't be able to make them be as loyal. To him. That's a hypothesis. I don't know. But I'm just, I'm just saying, I'll stop there and say that engagement is so much broader than negotiation. We can't, we can't think, how do we get what we want in the next meeting? We're not going to get what we want in the next meeting. Uh, we have to have a longer term point of view. We have to think regionally and globally and socially. And unfortunately, we're going to be unhappy about the situation in Afghanistan for a long time and nothing's going to change that. Oh, I just want to say one other thing. About, about sanctions, you know. What's the point of sanctions? Because sometimes people talk about sanctions like the point of sanctions is to hurt the bad guys, weaken them, and get rid of them. But the official documents about why we're opposing sanctions is there are sanctions against that are uh, because of specific behaviors and policies. So it's as if we wanted the sanctions to cause a change in behavior and policies. So to do that, we would have to communicate to make them effective in that way, if that's what you want to do. Uh, you would have to communicate to the object of the sanctions, the Taliban in this case, what they would need to do to get some result. And you, in doing that, you have to bear in mind they don't hear what you think you're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't believe a word you're saying. Okay, uh, I could I tell you a lot of stories about that. You need to have relationships and build and find out who is leaning your way. Who you know, uh, it's just not. I mean, I was once. Sorry, I'm gonna have to cut you yeah. off. Okay, <laughs> I told him that Tayabaga didn't hear what he thought he was saying, and he said, no, I was very clear with him. Well, it turned out he didn't hear. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Nasma Talil. I'm sorry I was late. Um, I was actually taking a genocide class at the law school. Um, I'm a student here at Columbia. Um, we were talking about ethnic minorities. And um, just to kind of echo what Ali said, if um, you would be able to speak a little bit about the Hazara. Um, and specifically, uh, and then another point, um, I have a loved one, he's Hazara, and um, since January, he's been imprisoned by the Taliban, and he's a humanitarian and a journalist. He covers the treatment of girls under the Taliban, and uh, he's uh, been moved from GDI prison to GDI prison, and uh, there's been really no movement in trying to get him released. And he's one of many, obviously. And so if you could also touch on that and um, if there's anything that could be done, challenges and solutions to, uh, you know, um, having these prisoners released um, uh, as related also to the ethnic minority. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Usman, and I'm a visiting research scholar at SIPA. Uh, Can you lift them uh, up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, being a neighbor of Afghanistan and being uh, uh, one of the countries that have been, you know, in the, all this process uh, in Afghanistan, all this uh, against um, war against terror and all that, that uh, what we feel in Pakistan that was a uh, 20 years of an exercise which uh, was uh, like uh, we returned to the same situation after 20 years of all that intense effort that we were doing in, in Afghanistan. Like uh, by my own experience, but I think that in Pakistan, we thought about that uh, while focusing on uh, military actions and all those things, why do not provide the resources to the people? Now, what I understand with the women rights in Afghanistan, it's we are talking more perhaps about the behavior of 
people that they want they don't want girls to go to school uh, that i think perhaps what i have read about is that the taliban or the afghanistan is not one entity in that sense that they are influences in different areas they have their own uh thinking about what sharia is like we have in pakistan in pakistan we have some provinces where the education level is pretty much good and then in some provinces the education is a bit less because of these issues that they have about girls or women uh uh what women are allowed to do and what not to do so in afghanistan why don't we uh try to provide the resources to the girls that they can get educated now we know that we have those online boards and all those things why don't provide them resources that they can continue with their education and then obviously what we are calling about the engagement with the taliban and uh, it's perhaps like uh, emboldening them in their behavior what else what other choice do we have uh, rather than to talk to the taliban because if you don't engage with the people who are in power over there how would you be you know uh, getting them to do something what we want them to or that the behavior might lighten or uh, they might loosen up their thought a bit uh, in the future if they see uh, certain things from the public because i think that uh, without the support of the public over the general public over there thinks that what is right or wrong uh, they would not be influenced Uh, so i would rather my question is that why don't we focus on providing the resources to the people over there that they can uh, have the education rather than it's uh, going out into the university or in those places provide them with resources at their home and they can stay home and they can get educated thank, thank you. you hi everybody thank you so much this was a really fascinating fascinating panel I'm Dana Birdie. I'm a faculty member at New York University and I work on international education politics. Um I have a comment and a question. The comment is that um I think it's important to keep in mind as a point of fact that the Taliban's edict on girls education as you all know is deeply unpopular in the country and we have data that show that. So at the primary school level there's essentially no variation in support for girls education from the most conservative members of the country across the rural areas male heads of households men who are the Taliban base and um at the secondary school level there's also majority of support uh, almost 60% we asked questions about the difference between support for um education for the soul Mm-hmm. and education for the world and this support is for worldly education mm-hmm. so i just want to make that clarification the question i have is um i found a comment about uh, the discussion of holding the taliban to account for their commitment to bringing back education for girls eventually uh, as long as it conforms to sharia law I, I, we have heard that before and we're over the many years in the previous regime right and it didn't happen in the past in the five years they were in power um in the past and so i'm curious um not not to say that it wouldn't happen and it couldn't happen and i think the pragma- pragmatic approach is interesting i wonder what it could look what would that look like what could that look like particularly given that there of this rural conservative group of the country there's the support for worldly education so what i'm wondering is how to how to support those folks those voices across the country who don't really have a voice so much today and and i i'm curious to hear from from our colleague subatul um please to hear more about um what you would envision if you if you were to hold hold them to account given mm-hmm. this emphasis now on the lemma across the country the building of madrasas um it doesn't uh it 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 seems to me like it might um diverge into an area that is maybe not what uh, people across the country would envision but i'm curious to hear how 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 maybe not to how to support a vision that um others other afghans have thank you Um uh, so first of all thank you so much for the insightful conversation like engagement. My name is NG, I'm a master in international affairs at CIPA. My concentration is international security policy which is why 
it was very interesting for me to hear about your thoughts on engagement in Afghanistan. Now, I have a question that is more towards the diplomatic side. Uh, so considering the diplomatic, geopolitical and trade dynamics and the recent Kazakh-Afghan business forum that was held in August, do you think Kazakhstan, together with other Central Asian neighbors, will play an increasing key role in international efforts to promote human rights in Afghanistan? And more broadly, what do you think of current Astana Kabul relations and where do you think they will be, which direction do you think they will move towards in the future? And thank you again. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Okay, <laughs> um, I'll try to be concise. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, uh, this was a really refreshing conversation um, to hear this dialogue. My name is Chantel. I work in the Program for Economic Research here at Columbia, and I also serve as the advisor for the Afghan Student Alliance here at Columbia University. Um, I have a question for really all three of you. Um, something that was really refreshing about this conversation that all of you touched on in one way or another is how in Afghanistan, not everyone is pro or anti-Taliban, right? And there is a space in the middle. Um, Hosna, when you talked about, you know, going to villages and talking about why education or financial independence is important and why that is something that we should care about. Um, something that I noticed in both informal dialogue at Columbia, uh, dialogue in national news and then in international news, right? is this dichotomy in the conversation that you are either, and everyone in Afghanistan, right, is very pro-Taliban or they are very anti-Taliban, right? And that it doesn't exist. And even when you interact with the Afghan diaspora in the US, I I have, I have interacted with the Afghan diaspora for, for quite a while now. And I would argue the people that I interact with are maybe from, 10 to 15 provinces in Afghanistan, right? And at the elite universities, they're maybe from three, uh, which means there's a huge portion of the Afghan population that is left out. When you're trying to define the Afghan population, we just talked about the 40 million, right? There hasn't been a census in Afghanistan since 1979. So we see so many times this kind of dichotomy in conversation. And I wonder what you think about how this hurts, helps, or doesn't really play a role in policymaking in and for Afghanistan, both at, at the like Afghan national level and at the international level. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hewat Khan Shalamkhil. I'm an Afghan student on campus. Actually, I took my last class in August, so I can officially call myself an alumni. I was the, the president of the Afghan Student Alliance on campus. So if Professor Robin uh, comments did not convince you that Afghanistan is such a complicated matter that we usually even have a hard time asking the question. Uh, so my, I don't have a question. I will not betray the trend. Uh, I, I'm here to ask for your support. We are advocating for a particular scholarship for the, uh, for Afghan females on campus. We, uh, we did this last year. Columbia was muted. They did not respond to our emails. So I will be standing out here, uh, taking your names, your uni. So this is actually what we are talking about. Practical steps. If you can just, uh, give me your uni and support our cause, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. And yes, welcome. Though for those of you who are new to the discussion of Afghanistan, please don't be disheartened. This is, at least I can guarantee that Afghanistan will never leave you a dull moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> دایی با دایی آواخی اکثر گفتگوهای شکلی میگره یا جایی میشنوی در بعضی از گفتگوه میشنوی که نگن طالب ها اکثر پشتون ها طالب نستن و طالب ها همه اشتون پشتون نستن یک بحثی که معمولا در جای را مفتاده و ما میبینم که اکثر تلاش های تا را صورت میگه یا اکثر 
نشانه هایی در آمیه که این برای ما بگه که قسمتی از پشتونه ها که خود طالب نمیبینن یا مخالف سیاست های طالبه یا مخالف حتی حکومت طالبه و طالبه قبول نداره گروه به عنوان مخالف نمید و پوزیسیون نمیتون بگم به عنوان مخالف برای ما جلوه بده یا خودشان بخواهید ای رو نشان بدن سوال ما اینجا است با توجه به عدم اعتمادی که چندین سال بین اقوام در اقوام افغانستان در افغانستان با توجه در تاریخ که سر افغانستان رو گذاشته عدم اعتمادی وجود داره ما چطور میتونیم بر فرض اگر مقدار دورتر بودیم در بیاییم تشکیل که طالب نیستن اونها رو عنوان یک مخالفی طالبان حساب کنیم و بیاییم دور همو مخالفان پشتون با طالبان در مبارزه هستن قبول ندارن دور از یک مثلا یک اپوزیسیون شکل بگیره یک گروه مخالف خیلی جدی شکل بگیره آیا چی تضمینی است که ما این اپوزیسیون یک اپوزیسیون نفوذی و ساخته شده خودی طالبان نبینیم به خصوص که در یه آخر خیلی پالیسی های عجب قریبی داره که ای آدم با کاملا درک نکنه که پالیسی پالیسی ساده نیست پالیسی نخبست که داره شکل گرفته اونجی حالا از هر طرف که دکتر بشه من میخوام ببوسیم که آیا چی تضمینی وجود داره که ای اپوزیسیون اپوزیسیون نفوزی نباشه و بیایا به شکلی عمل کنه که جریان مخالفت در بماره و طرفی که خودشون میخواید مثال خیلی ساده شما میتونم بگم در اتفاق اخیری که در ایران افتاده یک, یک اپوزیسیون نفوزی شکل دادن و به صورت خیلی جالب آمدن جریان اقلاق و تغییر دادن من میخوام ببینم این سال بیشتر با آقای غزنی سایی که قبلا ما گفتگو داشتیم نه فقط همین سال داشتیم که آیا شما فکر نکنید که اگر میتونید چیزی اگر شکل بگره آیا جاگو خواهد بود؟ شکر Yes. Oh, you're going to do the translation. Sure, sure. <laughs> Hopefully I remember everything. He did. I know. that uh, Dr. Saeb, help me if I miss anything. Or maybe I can just summarize it. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. The question is that currently uh, Taliban movement, majority of them are Pashtun, and there are uh, people making argument that Pashtuns are not Talib or not all Talibs are Pashtuns. Uh, considering this current situation that Taliban are Pashtun. So, and then there are some Pashtun who consider themselves against the Taliban. What if an opposition takes shape around this Pashtun who are outside the Taliban and against Taliban, and then over the time they, uh, they take this opposition into a different direction, into their interest? But Rafman of Oh, it would be a symbolic opposition and it ultimately it will end up again in something that's not in the interest of people who are not Pashtun. So that's the question. In Iran, something similar happened that opposition was sabotaged or taken uh, a dis- Uh, distract, distract by a group that got into the opposition. So let me propose this. There's a lot on the table. Um, as established, a lot of comments, few questions. Um, I am before I come to the panel. I'm just gonna because his his name was mentioned, and Scott Smith is here. For those of you who don't know him, um, first I'll say he used to teach at Columbia. Uh, a very good class on Afghanistan. He um, is also, I believe, the longest serving non-Afghan UN official in Afghan history at this point. I think that may, be, I think that may actually be accurate. Um, been serving in one capacity or another um, for many decades and is currently the political director of the uh, UN mission to, in Afghanistan and is here from Kabul. So, Scott, I just want to give you an opportunity if you'd like to, to make pose a question or make any quick comments. Stand up here. Whatever you prefer. Uh, I, I like what you can hear. Um, look at first, as somebody who, for whom this question is not theoretical, but, you know, a daily activity, I think that the panelists and, and also the uh, those who put questions outline the dilemmas that we have, you know, very, very well in terms of um, 
uh, what we're trying to do through this engagement. And you know, I also want to echo Barney's point that a lot of it is about learning. Um, we at Yanama are criticized for not having changed the situation enough, not having changed the Taliban. But a lot of, I would say, my we received a mandate in March of 22 where we were able to talk to Taliban about critical issues. And I would say it's been the first six or nine months just trying to develop these relationships and sort of understand what they're understanding or not understanding um, and, and, and just build a personal kind of trust. Um, so uh, uh, at the end of the day, um, I think that the only way that engagement could possibly, and it's, it's not a guarantee, lead to a more positive change that we would like to see is appealing to Taliban self interest. Now, this creates a few problems. The first one is uh, their self interest is primarily survival. And do we want to commit to a better Taliban that's still a Taliban? Um, and I would say the policy of, of, of UNAMA is for, you know, inevitably, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, there, there's not a huge alternative, um, and there's not an appetite from the national community for significant other kinds of, of, of pressure. Then the second problem is among the Taliban, uh, there are disagreements about what is their self interest. And the diplomat colleague of mine put it quite well, where he said, you know, some of the Taliban, like the leadership, who govern on behalf of the dead, and others who govern on behalf of the living. So if you go to Hyperdola and say, should girls go to school? which we did, um, and we put it in front of him as a sort of a yes or no, tomorrow the semester starts, but is when you know, girls going to school or not, his reflection will probably be, did 50,000 fighters of ours be martyred for girls to go to school? And the answer was no. But you have another generation who are younger who think if we can sort of uh, play this well, we can be in charge of this country for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, we recently had a team of, of people who were actually working with a special coordinator who has been appointed by the Security Council to deliver a report in, in, in November. And so his staff came, traveled quite widely around the country, and said wherever we went, there were four things that Afghans, ordinary Afghans, told us that were concerns with this. One was they want those schools. The second one was they they are they don't like the let's say, mullahization, for lack of a better word, or the deprofessionalization of the government, which is beginning to happen. Third, jobs in the economy. And then fourth, what? Climate change. This is the third year of drought right now. It's, 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 it's quite serious. Three of these issues are issues that are direct results of decisions of the Taliban leaders. So, in that order? Well, that's given to us, but I'm not sure yeah, if, it was, if it was ranked. Um, but it was consistent. So, uh, so you have the leadership actually taking decisions that might undermine them and, and increase the gap between the Taliban leadership and the and and and, and the population. Um, uh, so there is a real, I think, struggle and debate going on inside of the of the movement. But what those who are on the same more moderate side say is, the less you international speak about this, the easier it is for us to try and and and, and make the case, which is another. Final, final point, um, and it also goes to uh, uh, Barney's point about the region. Um, what some of the people that I speak to inside say is, and actually it, it, it's official, they, you know, they all want to talk about a balanced foreign policy, so they're trying to you know, keep um, India and Pakistan both sort of engaged. You know, Qatar and UAE had this big thing over the airport, and we get the concert. So they're, they're trying to keep this balance, and they, and they tell me, we also want a balance between China and the U.S. We want the West to be involved. We don't want to just have uh, depend, you know, on 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 one uh, sort of uh, superpower. I suppose. So, so we're trying to keep the door open to the West as long as possible. But if that door closes, we're not going to have another option. Now, the question that I have, more strategically, especially when we talk about women's rights and and, and girls' education and so forth, is once the Taliban basically say the door has been closed to the West. Which is even high so They're never going to take us seriously. They're never going to recognize us. They're never going to give us, you know, serious aid. Um, and then Afghanistan becomes, as it is now, more and more in integrated into the political economy of the region, which includes sanctioned countries like Iran, sanctioned countries like Russia, themselves under sanctions, and then uh, you know China to the east. 
where will the leverage be on sort of normative issues that we're not engaging with them on because of, mm -hmm. if that makes grammatical mm -hmm. sort of uh, sense. And I think that's a long-term scenario that uh, needs to be, I think, considered by those countries who still you know, say that these are, are important values. And, and those countries who say that we want to preserve some of the gains of 20 years and 2,000 U.S. lives more you know, from NATO partners and $2 trillion. Um, because all of that could basically go away entirely if um, uh, the Afghanistan the does sort of drift more and more into the um, regional orbit. It will always, I think, it has to go back to the region, but the question is, you know, does the West want to maintain some sort of influence or minimal leverage uh, on behalf of those issues? Thank you so much, Scott. Oh, that's extremely helpful. Um, I am going to be very unfair now and give each of you only five minutes to uh, respond to any set of the questions or comments that you heard. This is your, your time to reflect back to the audience. Arif, I'm going to start with you and go to Hasna, and then Sipat has the last word. Always difficult to start. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are great questions. I took lots of notes. Um, I think on the engagement, we have to get out of a binary thinking. Um, that is not an achievable goal. Um, but what we are proposing, I think from, I'm hearing from my colleagues here as well, is that we need to also move from a Taliban only to an Afghanistan inclusive approach. Because this is a country that belongs to 40 million people, not 70,000 fighters of the Taliban. Um, I agree we don't know a lot. Um, uh, but we are also in contact with our families, with our friends on, on the ground. And um, uh, the Taliban do not have popular support. We have to amplify narratives um, that are helpful for Afghanistan. I think the least that can be done is, if you're not going to help the Taliban, then don't hurt other people as well. On, I've been watching and tracking how uh, uh, the UN and other countries are pursuing engagement. And there are a series of um, strategies that uh, I think I have noticed. And um, I think sometimes it makes us nervous that we might be uh, we might be using maybe some of the same strategies as we move forward uh, to at least point um, on engagement. Um, we are also not saying that the same things should continue. Um, reciprocity, for example, has been used as a strategy. We will give you something, you give us something back. But now the Taliban has everything that they need. What do you have that you can offer to the Taliban? Do you have anything? Um, third party intervention has been used. OIC, OLEMA from countries X and Y, send them um, because they are maybe authority, maybe they like them more, maybe because of that they would listen to them. Uh, we just need to evaluate whether that has helped or not. Appeals to logic, to Islamic values, to emotions, have they worked? Um, and if those have not worked, then what can work? And, and again, we're coming back to maybe defocusing actors, not so much talking about actors, but talking about the different layers of the society, about the problems and the challenges that people are fo um, focusing on. So our, the, the Taliban are very young. They didn't, ex they didn't exist. They don't exist. They haven't existed for a long time. They're only like how many years old? Maybe like less than 30 years old from the 90s. Our problems have existed from long ago and our problems are also going to probably outlive them. Because of this, our proposal is that we need to get out of a Taliban only approach toward Afghanistan and think about the whole of society, think about the challenges, and then work with multipl a multiplicity of actors in order to address those challenges.
I think that uh, um, maybe I'll stop at that. Thank, Thank you. Hasan, I would start with the last uh, comment Scott made. Um, I might come across as a little bit optimistic, but that's what I believe in. I don't think that the Taliban have given up on the hope of Western support. One of the main reasons is, uh, Dr. Sebsebrat may be able to add here or might correct me here if I'm wrong. One of the main reasons is the humanitarian support that they're getting from the West. The flow of the money that they're getting from the West, they're not going to get it from China, Russia, Iran, or any of the neighboring countries. And that is a bit of a relief for them to manage the chaotic situation, which is already on the ground. So, Yes, at the leadership level with UNAMA, they might not discuss it, but their uh, clerk in, in a mosque is clearly complaining that while well, the West is not offering us that level of support that they used to, to offer to the Republic, that's why we are failing in governance. That's how they're justifying it. But just looking at the details of those grievances that somebody in a village in a mosque is, is um, mentioning, I think that is coming out of frustration. And they do know that that is the money that none of these countries are giving. Even if they would be absorbed in the geopolitical, um, uh, regional geopolitics or um, political economy, I don't think they would be able to survive if people are hungry, if people are raising, standing against them, not because of human rights or women rights or, or any of these um, uh, values, but because they want to survive. They, they, they need to have food on the table. So. I do believe that that is still, I mean, the West still have its seat on the table to talk to the Taliban or to, um, um, the Taliban has a lot to lose, actually, in, in this case. So I might be a little bit optimistic, but I do believe that that is something that uh, the West still gives the West, and the West the upper hand. When it comes to, um, yeah, you, you made a very interesting comment. Um, I am somebody who is a strong believer that not all Pashtuns are Talib. I'm a very strong believer and I'm very loud about it. And not all Talibs are Pashtun. I do believe that mass majority of Talibs are Pashtun, but not all Talibs are Pashtun. Taliban did not take over Northern Afghanistan with their Pashtun army. There had been none Pashtuns who helped them. And yes, th that might be based on different grievances against the government. There, there have been warlords. There have, there have been criminal networks, groups. Yes, there are minority, but there are. So when we are saying like all Taliban are Pashtun, I'm not, I'm not Pashtun, actually. But I've worked with Pashtuns. I, I mean, Pashtuns who have served in the front line against the Taliban. They fought for 20 years. I do believe we're adding to the tension and we are not helping. If we are isolating all the Pashtuns, like we're labeling them with them being supporters of the Taliban or the Taliban, how we are going to create the mass support against the Taliban or how we are going to influence. They are going to be effective if we would have them on, on our side. And here's one more thing that I would like to add. I've had Pashtun colleagues on the front, front line who served against, the, I mean, in, in the battlefields, um, countering the Taliban, countering terrorism, they were brutally murdered in Jalalabad and many other provinces. And just because they were Pashtun, that, that, that is heartbreaking to see that that's not even covered in, in most of the media. Yes, I wrote about it publicly a lot, but for me, those faces, and there are many, many of those faces, comes in front of my 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 eyes when I'm uh, hearing the fact that, okay, all questions are Talib. No, they're not. But when it comes to oppositions of, against the Taliban, yes, we don't have Pashtuns leading an opposition apart from um, a half-baked opposition, which is which belongs to General Razir, mm. um, which I don't know what they're doing, actually. Apart from that, we don't have any Pashtun-led opposition, but with the Liberation Front, which is led by General Zia, they have many Pashtun members who are targeting Taliban in their stronghold, and that's Kandahar. So I do believe that they do have the potential to stand against the Taliban, either politically or through armed resistance or even through civil society. So I am a strong believer of that. Um, I did receive a comment on girls' education and provision of resources to bridge the gap. What you're proposing that is bridging a gap that's not sustainable and that is not going to offer the access to education to all girls in Afghanistan. That is going to, I mean, how many girls can have access with the 
technological development in Afghanistan or access to internet or everything else? How many girls would be able to access that? We are not going to be able to reach every girl in Afghanistan or reach at least a mass majority of girls in Afghanistan. The system you're talking about, that's the system that I studied. I mean, with that system uh, in during previous Taliban regime, that's not sustainable. Not every girl had been privileged enough like me to have access to those um, resources. So yes, that can bridge the gap in short term, but in long term, there has to be a solution. Uh, that's not a long term solution, I would say. Um, there's one more comment on um, that you made about um, different understandings of Sharia and then the um, population across the country in different areas might uh, have different levels of support or even may not support the girls' education. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, thank you so much for bringing the, the numbers. Um, there are people who are, I call them survivors or I call them the silent population, and they're the mass majority of the population. The very pro-Taliban, the very anti-Taliban like me, we're minority. Mm -hmm. There are the mass majority of population, they've been through a lot. I mean, how can we expect them to stand up against the Taliban if they have never lived a life without conflict? And that is my grandmom's generation. So uh, they not are not necessarily supporting the Taliban. Yes, they are not resisting, they're not supporting. But if you propose something or if you at least provide them access to education, it doesn't mean that they're not going to change their mind, even if they are not allowing now their girls to go to school. So what we are talking about is to have that foundation so that people gradually would, would uh, support girls' education or women's rights or anything else. My last comment is um, on the um, Kazakhstan. How Kazakhstan can play a role in Afghanistan? Kazakhstan can play, I mean, being a regional country, being a country that Taliban, of course, want to engage with, can play a tremendously helpful role, but it depends on Kazakhstan. Would they want to um, put themselves in a very uncomfortable spot with the Taliban when it comes to women's rights? Do they really care about it? I can't say that most of Central Asian countries or regional countries in the Middle East or Afghanistan's neighboring country would really care about human rights or women's rights or put themselves, at least that's worth enough for them to put themselves in a very uncomfortable spot. So that's up to Kazakhstan. Yes, they have a very helpful role, of course, but we need to, um, uh, sorry, Dr. Rubin, that I'm using this we. <laughs> we, it means like people who are really well-wishers of the Afghan people. Um, <laughs> but we need to find ways to engage them more and more where they feel both comfortable, but in long term, we can see that uh, it's, it's aligned with their interest. At the end, thank you so much for um, providing this opportunity to all of us. And it has been such an engaging discussion. I learned so much from everybody. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for all the, all the good questions and important issues. I would uh, shortly, in reply to Abidisseb's question, what we presented as at the beginning, I said short term and long term. So the women and girls education and rights issue is a pressing issue for the immediate uh, term. It is very obvious that yes, all Afghans, me, you, everybody else, we do need to have a pluralistic, inclusive political system in the long run and we all must have equal rights as any other uh, developed society has. I mean, that's very obvious and we should be united for that effort. But just as a, a short term, uh, I focus more on women's rights and girls' education. Uh, I do agree with the uh, uh, professor and also Scott that the knowledge about Afghanistan in general, then Taliban specifically, is very uh, not very extensive, not very deep. Uh, I would talk about this part now. Actually, I, earlier you asked, but I didn't go into the details. This one and a half year, all the communications I had, this environment for policy making that is emerging and it is getting consolidated day by day. It is very interesting, but it is not rocket science. It is workable. <laughs> uh, the central madrasas like Darululumi Markazi of Kabul, the scholars who are there, mostly there in their early 60s and late 50s, and they are the ones who were teaching in different madrasas in Pakistan, and now they moved to Kabul. I'm just giving this one example. Whenever there is an issue of for example, establishing a special force for the Amir in Kandahar 
in how is Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense under different groups reacting to, to this situation, what they do, they call a dinner meeting. This I'm talking about practically what I observe, what I, uh, they call a meeting with the scholars of this madrasa in Darulum Markazi. It is at the outskirts towards Pulicharhi in a huge, beautiful complex that was uh, is, uh, constructed by the funds of previous Ministry of Education for some college training plan, uh, uh, college teachers training uh, program. Uh, so they hold a meeting and they hold their discussions there. And when they don't reach a decision, they follow it up with further meetings in Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense. And these are not the meetings that come on their media. It doesn't get reflected in YouTube or social media, but they do reach a decision. They do get their consultation and they do act upon it. So this is one thing. What I'm proposing, and that is that we should start understanding the system in a proper assessment before that window is closed that you mentioned. And I am afraid that that window is not going to stay open mm -hmm. for very long. Then international humanitarian aid has dropped this year. If it drops further, then mm -hmm. Taliban will shut, close, close the UNAM office and tell everybody go home. They have done that in the past. They can do it again. Swedish committee was doing a lot of good work, mostly in uh, southern provinces, which where Taliban support comes from. Uh, but on the Quran burning issue, they shut it down, go home. And this can happen. So before that happens, we need to study their policy making environment. Now, what is the role of the Darulifta in Kandahar? Why was Darulifta, the central Darulifta, moved from Kabul to Kandahar with the group of uh, 12, 15 uh, scholars, and how are they connected and how is their access to Amir? What I'm hearing, their access to the leader is almost immediate. Whenever the Darul Ifta asks, they can access. While if a minister wants, he has to wait at least for a month in Kandahar till he is able to see the Amir. So these are the things that we need to study and study is possible when I was there. On the governance, I have a research organization, Karzi Research Foundation, I was leading under previous government. And normally, I used to do the sensitive political issue uh, risk assessment for the previous government. While I was there, I, I offered this assistance to one that let's hold talks about what type of government and governance would be more inclusive and more sustainable. I found very supportive comments from people that I was talking to. I received very welcoming comments. And they said, okay, hold it in a nice place like Serena, or <laughs> I couldn't do it because there were other threats coming uh, around. So I'm proposing, let us study their policy environment. Uh, how is it making? What piece of knowledge they use? What is the logic? And how they make uh, rationalization of political policy decisions. Thank you. So, Can I just make one quick yeah. comment? Is, is it okay? 30 seconds. Sure. I just want to say that we also have to maybe decouple the madrasas from the Taliban only, because that can be dangerous. We have to study madrasas, absolutely be uh, short-term responsive to the Taliban systems, but that is also a long-term strategic thing to do because they have existed before the Taliban, they will exist after the Taliban. Well, I cannot thank the three of you enough for such a very rich and sophisticated and complex conversation. For a full audience, it's very reassuring for me. Sometimes I fear, does anyone care about Afghanistan? Does anyone want to come and talk about it anymore? To have a full room it's, is very gratifying. And my heartiest congratulations to Columbia University for securing Sibgat Ghaznawi as a scholar at Saltzman. If this is what he can produce after such a short time of being here. This tells you a lot about his generation and about what's possible going forward. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming.